God bless each of you. I just got done recording. Let's see. Okay, we have volume. Everything is up. Forgive that lateness. I just got finished at uh, a little after 7. And but I'm here now. How about that? Good to see you guys. Listen, I want to know today. How many people are ready? Really ready? Uh-oh, what is that? How many people are ready for, for the times to come? Right, of course, things are escalating, right? They are. And uh, times are getting, times are changing. They are. They're changing quick. You know what that means, don't you? As times change, so does your time get closer. Your time is closer. And what I mean by your time is that what you may not... See, we're going to have to go into the Book of Enoch. I'm going to have to read you guys something out of the Book of Enoch. Not today, but the Lord made some promises throughout the Old Testament, New Testament, Book of Enoch, and all these other books that as these days come, right? You will receive help. Let me, let me explain it to you this way. Many of you have not had... You've not had a breakthrough, right? You've not. And for the most part, many of you, now I don't know this personally, right? I'm just speaking by general terms that many of you have tried so many different things to get your life in line again, right? And it hasn't worked out. It just didn't work out. Um, but in these days, you're going to find out why. As you find out why, right, it's imperative that you apply what you learn of the Word of God to your life. Somebody asked me one time, they said, uh, they said, Mike, how do you walk out things in the Bible? You know, how do you do that? How do you actually start changing your life? And I told this individual, as you read, right, when you read, after you read, apply what you have read to your life and live that way forevermore. And then you read again and apply that way to your life. Bit by bit, right? Little by little, apply the word of God to your life. Before you know it, your whole life is altered, right? That's how you change. That's how you really change. You start living what you read piece by piece by piece by piece. It's not good just to read it. I did this before. I used to read to capture the knowledge. I remember one time, which is why I have the advice to everybody. Don't read to combat somebody else's conversation or somebody else's point of view or something like that. Don't read for that purpose. Make sure that you're reading to know who Christ is. Make sure that you're reading to walk the walk, right? When you start walking or living your life by the word of God, by what you understand, this is important, not by you cannot live your life by what I understand. At no point did the Lord require anybody to live their lives by what they had no ability to comprehend. He didn't do that, did he? He met everybody where they were. He did. He spoke in simple terms. He did. Now, in this, this world that we live in, people have comp they have a big vocabulary. You know, they use big words to describe the silliest things. Right? We do that. We do that. Like if somebody says, well, you know, that's just full of ambiguity. And what that means is, right, that's very confusing. Right? Very confusing. So, but instead of using simple terms, people use these academic terms because it makes them sound like they're included in the world somehow. They're, they're up to times or something like that. So we complicate things as human beings. We do. We do. We complicate things. We do. I'm going to give you guys an example of, of how people have an inability to think these days. Right? Training other people is a tough job. And there was a time when I let people, right? I let people apply what they had learned. And I was just observing. I did not interfere. So you have a bunch of, you have a bunch of people out there. And they're setting up a camp or something like that. 
And so one of them says, well, we need to, uh, you know, we need to begin by, we need to dig this uh, protected area, our, our bunker, if you will. And while we're doing that, somebody needs to go ahead and start the uh, cover fire, which is a fire in, in, in a very deep place where you can, you know, no flames can be seen. So they they were trying to pick the best guy to do that, and they did. And the guy said, okay, um, well, before we start the fire, we need somewhere to sleep. All right, we need to, somewhere to sleep. So I'm just watching. I'm just watching. I'm evaluating. They did not make the fire. They're talking about somewhere to sleep. So they're getting, you know, the area together where they're going to sleep. We're going to sit down there. Uh, what, what positions are going to guard this, that, and the other? But they did not make a fire. Well, as a consequence of that, they did not set up areas of other things either. Because they were waiting on somebody else to do something before they did anything. Can you imagine a person saying, well, I'll make the fire after we determine where we're going to sleep? Now, that's just crazy. Let me tell you why. And this is how people are, because you guys do it at home. Have you ever been at home and somebody in this, uh, you know, you're going to clean the house or something, right? And you're looking at somebody else trying to get them to do one thing before you start doing your thing, but your thing has nothing to do with their thing. So nobody gets anything done, and a bit, you have a big discussion on what's going to happen first, right? Same thing they did in the field. They complicated something so easy. And they ended up doing nothing, right? They couldn't even understand what they were doing. So I told them, I said, listen, you guys were trying to determine an area to sleep in. And so you did not make the fire until you figured that out. Why? Why didn't you? And they gave me all sorts of explanations. Well, we need to have a good place to sleep. I said, but what does that have to do with the fire? Well, because we had a, what does that have to do with the fire? Right? Somebody could have started the fire. Right? Anybody could have started the fire so they would have fire. And then somebody else could have, you know, designated that area to sleep. But they didn't do either because they were waiting on the other guy. Do you not know that happens in life all the time? All the time. Like you're driving down the road. Right? And somebody cuts you off. You're in your car and you have a fit of carnality. Well, that person just cut me off. Did you see that person cut me off? Well, first of all, your comments, the other driver can't hear them. Anybody ever talk to the other driver but your windows are up? Nobody can hear what you're saying. So what you're doing is venting and you're wasting time. You want the other person to be correct. You start chewing the other person out. You're not making a difference. You're just wasting energy and oxygen. You're not doing anything. But before you know it, you develop a lifestyle of doing this, and you don't even know that you're doing it, right? So you're not helping anything. You're not, you're not adding to anything. You're complicating your own life. And before you know it, you're, you go home upset because somebody cut you off, but the other person has no idea that they cut you off. You've chewed the other person out. You can't stand other drivers. When you go out next time, you're looking for people to do things like that, and you will respond in kind. Then you develop these habits in life. You build upon that so that everybody who makes a mistake on the highway, you call it out. You start talking to them. Oh, but look at that idiot. Look what that, look at this person. I can't believe that person did that. Nobody can hear you talking about you. And what you're doing is you're spending your life out of control. Why? Because you want the other person to conform to the rules of the road. Just for you. The truth is you're finding something to complain about. There's something called offensive driving. When you drive a car, you do not drive a car expecting everybody to follow the rules. You drive a car and you look out for those who won't follow the rules. You take extra precautions. So that when something like that happens, you are prepared. And when they do cut you off, you simply hit your brakes, right? You don't have to say anything because you expected that. Listen to me. You expected that. Now, the, because you expected that, because you expected somebody not to follow their own rule set or rule set, you're not upset.
because you expected that. You expected somebody else to fall short. Versus you expecting everybody else to follow the rules. I'm trying to tell you something here. When you expect everybody else to follow the rules, you end up complicating your life to a degree that you're grumpy every day, all day. When you expect people to mess up the rules, you stand ready to help somebody understand how to do things a better way. Isn't that much more simpler? Isn't that in line with who God made you to be, who you really are? Right? None of you like to be upset. So let me ask you something. Then why do we practice being upset so much? Why don't we take every situation and turn it into something to be upset over? Why do we permit being upset to be a part of our lives every single day? When you wake up and somebody does something out of the ordinary in politics, you get upset. I don't get upset because I expect it. In fact, I expect everybody who's not covered by the blood of the Lamb to do things evil and devilish. And when they do something evil and devilish, there are many times you can help them out. Because you know what influence they did that by. Do you not know that makes a difference? Let me tell you what happens when you do that. Instead of pointing your finger at everybody it's saying what everybody did wrong, when you stand ready to help your fellow man out, you run demons off. That, you don't have to rebuke them or anything. Your simple stance of your readiness to assist somebody else with an upright heart, runs devils away. Do you know that? They cannot hang around in that atmosphere. They can't operate. They can't. But if you get irritated by the mistakes everybody else is making, right? Now you're holding yourself to a troublesome standard of the world, and you'll be grumpy all the days of your life. Anybody out there whose lives have not been working out right, you're pressing through, you're trying. The problem is this. You're trying to raise your life to a standard. It's not your life. Look at where you are right now. Look at everything wrong in your life right now. I want you to say this to yourself. This is where I am. I'm nowhere else but where I am. Isn't that the truth? I'm nowhere else but where I am. This is where I am. This is where I am. This is me. Right now, this moment, this is me. Say that to yourself. This is me. So that you can identify, number one, right? Everything that's gone wrong around you, it went wrong. And you did the best the way it is. But you're still who you are. You don't have to dwell on that. You don't have to beat yourself up for that. Right? To say, this is where I am. If you want to be healthy and you're not healthy, say, this is where I am. This is where I am. This is me. This is where I am. Okay? Shake the burdens off. You know what happens when you deny where you are, right? You're trying to be somewhere else. You're trying to project that you're somewhere else. You cause yourself weights and burdens and stress and all sorts of things. And you get grumpy. You're in the wrong spirit. Let's get in the right spirit. How do you do that? You tell everything around you, this is where I am. Everything that went wrong, went wrong. Everything I messed up, messed up. Everything somebody else messed up, it messed up. But this is where I am. Stop time and everything else and say, this is where I am. Then I want you to say, Lord, thank you for where I am. It could have been worse. Go ahead, say it. Have that understanding that your circumstances could have been far worse you have examples in your life of far worse positions that you could be in. Don't be a denier that things could be worse. Be thankful they're not worse. Accept where you are, and the closer you are to the bottom, the brighter the future of going up. How many of you are at the bottom? Type a one if you're at the bottom. Go ahead, type a one. Type a one if you're at the bottom. Type of one. Anybody at the bottom out there? You afraid to say it? Anybody afraid to say it? If you're at the bottom, you're at the bottom. That's where you are. Right? You may not know this, 
But you're ble- you're more blessed than those who are at the top. The ones at the top are at risk of falling. They're at risk of stepping into pride. They're at risk of being proud of their own accomplishments. And they, God says he will abase them. He will bring them down to the bottom. If you're at the bottom, say, this is where I am. And do me a favor, stop looking down. If you're at the bottom, you already know you're at the bottom. There's no need to look down to see where you are. You know where you are. There's only one place you can truly look. Going up again. But don't go up like last time. Right? you got to find out why you're at the bottom. You're at the bottom. Why? If you messed it up, then you messed it up. If somebody else had power over you, they got in the way, right? But they got the best of you, and you went down to the bottom, so be it. If you mismanaged, then so be it. But take note of why you're at the bottom. And simply say, Lord, okay, let me be humbled again. You're, anybody at the bottom is at the bottom so they can be humbled, so they will not live in pride. You're, if you're at the bottom, there's no need to have pride. No need. Be thankful. Because you're at the new start place. Everything, everything, everything that is lifted up within itself will be bought low. It will be abased. Just be thankful. That's part of your father's process. When you're at the bottom, that's where your hope comes from. You cannot hope for much at the top. You can't do it. It is stress to maintain that. Because who knows how a person got up there. Some people are at the top right now and they're stressed to the max. They know they're at the top, but they also know they have to maintain it. They also know that if they fall, everybody is watching. They also know that other people are going to crumble if they fall. It's a lot of stress. Don't build your life up like that, right? Don't build your life up by pride and self-deeds. This time, have your life built by blessings. Have your life built by supernatural intervention. Be appreciative of every step you go up that ladder. Take note of every step you take. You should know every step it takes to get to the top. The only way to know that is to really know where you are every single day. See, most people, they don't know where they are today. They don't know. They don't know how they got to the top. They don't know. They have forgotten the steps. When you forget the steps it took to get up to the top, you know what you start doing? You start blaming everybody else. You look down on other people. You actually feel like you're above somebody else. Who? You know what? I never feel like I'm above a soul, not one soul on this earth. You know that that's true. I never have that self-sensation as though I am worth more than anybody else, that I am more than anybody else. I never do. I did at one point. I did not like civilians. That's my confession. I did. I thought civilians were the were crybabies. I did. I, that they would dare complain about the blanket of protection we provided with our blood. And all they did was complain in the freedom that somebody else was fighting for. I used to have that thought almost continuously. Lots of times we would come from a mission and people would look down on us like we were the worst things in history, right? I didn't like civilians. They whined too much, complained about everything. They had everything and complained about everything they had. Backstabbers, noncommittal, temperamental, right? Like you one day, hate you the next. Weird. I did. I didn't like civilians. So I had a real military mindset. I did. The Lord fixed all of that. He did. Now I know every step it takes to get to where I'm going. I memorized every single step. I'm grateful for every single level. I take nothing for granted, and in my heart of hearts, I do not feel 
any value over anybody else. Do you know that? Everybody in my life and everybody outside of my life, I value more than mine. That's the truth. That's the truth. Let me ask you something. Is that in your heart? You cannot be a servant of the living God and you feel like your value is greater than somebody else's. Because you'll miss the whole thing. Hmm? You'll miss the whole thing. None of us. None of us. Should feel that way. Listen, so, if you're at the bottom, do it right this time. Do it right this time. Understand where you are. It happened. Now you have a starting point. But this time, go forward. In the Lord, this time, go forward. Having an understanding that you have a Savior that's raising you. That if you are raised, it's because of the Savior. And listen, apply what you learn of the Word of God to your life to walk it out. Don't wonder. I wonder if the Lord will bless me if I do so and so. I wonder if this outcome is going to be like the Bible says it will be, stop wondering. You don't have to wonder. Start living it. Start living it. That's when you start digging in the Word of God, and you say, wait a minute, how did God tell me to do this? That's when you ask your brothers and your sisters, hey, join me in prayer. I'm trying to find an answer to something. That's how you employ, you utilize your family, the family God has given you. Your eternal family, not your blood family. Your eternal family is based in the soul. Your blood family is based in flesh. We're not talking about the flesh family. We're talking about your eternal family. Those who really do serve the Lord, anyway, do that, right? Do that because the time that you're in, the time that you're in is going to shake and rock every single foundation that is not right. Every foundation that can be broken, will be broken. Do you know that? You're in that time. And nobody who truly loves the living God should have a broken foundation. Hmm. Nobody. We are truly about to go through some times that people are not looking for, right? They're not expecting them. The conditions are not expected. Right now, these are calm seas. It is not promised to last. But for you, for those of you who truly do trust in the Lord, who have not had your victory yet, you do know your victory is coming. You just have to realize where you are right now. You can't have a victory in denial of where you are, of the true things in your life. Right? And believe me, it's all about the word. Not accepting. You don't, it, you don't go and announce, write an article and say, this is what I did. Don't do that. No, don't do that. Just be thankful where you are. Have an understanding of where you are. Right? Never have anyone to blame for where you are. If you have someone to blame for where you are, you did not see your situation right. You didn't. You did not. That's a big key in life itself. If you can blame anybody for where you are, no matter what the condition, suppose you're, some ex sends you to jail. Don't blame the ex for that. Don't do it. Don't do it. Suppose because of a failed relationship, it's not your fault you have a bad relationship with your children. Don't blame anybody for that. Don't do it. Don't do it. See, there's a principle at play here. You ready? There's always something more that we can do. There's always a better way that we can communicate. Always. There are thousands of ways to reach a person. We don't exercise thousands of ways, do we? We often respond emotionally in situations like that, which are not the right responses. So always have it in your heart to know that I could have done something more. Never have someone to blame for where you are. But only thank God for the identification of where you are. Say, okay, this is me. I'm right here. This is my starting point. Let me go up from here. Right? If you know you're at the bottom, you need not look down. 
Never look down again because you know where you are. Be thankful for the new start because it could have been far worse. You could have been six feet under. There is no new start when you're six feet under, is there? So never think that you have no hope. You have lots of hope. Let your trust be in Christ. Let him lead your life this time, not you, him. Let him do it. And watch the difference manifest every day of your life. Every day. He will succeed where you had no idea success could be had. He will prevail in those areas you have no sight in. He'll clear the way where all you would see are obstacles. With him, you can walk right through any storm. And it's still a storm, but you walk right through it. You don't have the stamina nor the energy to continue based on your plan. When you're thankful for where you are, and you're walking with the Lord as by his stamina, you stay upright. That means you're not maintaining anything by your own power, but by his. The same spirit that gave Jesus power to be raised from the dead, you have access to. The same spirit whereby Jesus prayed all night instead of sleeping, you have access to. Oh, my. You know what it means? If we get tired, it's because we've been exercising everything that we can do. How can you get tired when you're doing everything you're instructed to do? See, the greatest way to learn is to be instructed. The greatest way to start messing up in life is when you take control of your life and start plowing your own path. You don't learn that way. You're simply left with a handful of mistakes, sometimes small successes, which eventually crumble. We all know that. But when you follow Christ, you're learning every single day of your life. In that way, you become like a child, eager to learn. What was said, you will in no wise enter into the kingdom of God unless you become like one of these little ones. Well, a little one is eager to learn. They're full of questions. They're not trying to pave their own way to things they don't understand. No. They want to know about every step they're taking to them be that same way. Hmm? Find Christ in every step that you take. Find Christ in every moment of your life. And you will find exactly what you're looking for. Once you find that, you're free. You're free. You're going to be free. While everybody else potentially will still be in misery. Don't be fooled by those who act like they're happy. How many of us acted like we were happy in view of everybody else, but on the inside we were torn to shreds? We just knew how to put on that smiling face. Do you know how many times we fooled other people that way? No, it's time now to smile for real, even in troubled times, because this is your season. This is your season. This is not anybody else's season. This is your season. The same season where evil begins to conquer the earth. That's your season. It's not time for you to run. Unless it be in joy. This is your season. This is your time of growth and deliverance. This is your time when you experience the absolute deliverance of the Messiah in your life. This is your time. Not times before. And you knew that. The times before were empty, weren't they? They're full of trials and everything else. While the world went far beyond you, you were stuck in limbo. You didn't fit. All of you know that you did not fit in that time that was before. So don't go back down memory lane. Don't do that because you did not fit. This is your time. This is it. A great breaking 
is coming. This is it. This is that moment. This is the return to innocence. This is your time. This is it. That's it. Now, I warn you, all those who seek to keep control, your rudder is already broken, and your boat's going to go in the wrong direction. Those who lose control for the sake of Christ, you're going to find all control. You cannot keep control with a broken rudder. All right. You guys have that. Somehow, someway, you have that. Right? You do. You have that. Now, we've been talking about Revelation for weeks, actually. We have been talking about that for weeks, right? I'm interested today, before we catch up on everything else, of what your questions are regarding Revelation up until this point. Some real ones. Some of those real headbangers, right? Everything is on the table in Revelation, but what are your questions regarding Revelation? Revelation is important because when you understand it, you understand the process of God's deliverance. You'll understand the time you're living in, right? You're not some victim out here, by the way. That's not what you are. You know what the Bible it says, as a man thinketh, so is he. So what do you think yourselves to be? As a man thinketh, so is he. So what do you think yourselves to be? Hmm? What do you think yourselves to be? Somebody said, are big earthquakes coming soon? I'll tell you something. What's worse, a thousand small earthquakes or one big one? Well, I'll share that with you, William. Over the last two years, more infrastructure has been damaged as though we have had some 9.0 earthquake every single month. Do you know that? That's, the, that's how much damage has been done by these small earthquakes. Sometimes we look for the big thing, right? And we miss the small things. Let me give you a hint of something. God works by giving a bunch of small things that equal a big deal. Now, the world cannot see this, and it is designed so that the world can never see it. It's designed so that you can see it, not the world. Remember what Jesus said, they knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be, which means the world's going to know nothing until the situation overtakes them, which means they did not yield to any signs because they didn't see any. Had the world recognized a real biblical sign they would have changed, but they did not. So what does that tell you? That means that you are the ones who recognize the subtleties in the changes. You all are. Hmm? Somebody says, uh, let me go back. Let me go back. I just saw it. Uh, let me go back. Get over there, mouse. Get, 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 get. What? Where'd the mouse go? Come on. Cooperate. <sighs> Right. Okay, there we go. Let's see. Oop, there it is. Okay, somebody said, uh, somebody said, Mike, any insight revelation on how the earth helped the woman? Yes, conditions of the earth. If you go back and you read back during those times, right, it was the conditions of the earth, the insurvivability of the desert. Those, remember the great, the great period of storms that happened in the Middle East? It helped the woman. It actually helped the woman. The earth did. So, there's an answer. You know, historically, the Middle East has some of the most awful storms that used to kick up during the controversies of Israel. It did. It always, it always happened. It did. There were some big earthquakes back then, too, that almost consumed a bunch of Persian troops. Things like that would happen all the time. All the time. So that would be my, that's what I'm pointing towards concerning that scripture when the earth helped the woman right it opened up its mouth and swallowed the flood a flood 
in the Old Testament have flooded the troubles, right? You remember what the Old Testament says. When, when, the, when Satan comes at you like a flood, the Lord will raise up a standard against him. That's precisely what the living God did. Remember, God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. So his language is consistent, right? So when the devil comes at you like a flood, the Lord will raise up a standard against him, right? Same thing. So that flood is a host of troubles. That's what it is. A flood is a host of troubles. Not just one thing, but a bunch of things, right? And the Lord will raise up a standard against them. Now, to raise up a standard means the trouble is coming in, a set, in, in set conditions. If those conditions change, it can nullify the flood itself, the flood the devil is sending. And that's something. So that, that myriad of issues that are coming at you, right, can be overwhelmed by a change in conditions very quickly. And when it says the Holy Spirit and the church are restraining evil, God is restraining evil. God appointed God appointed in the Old Testament almost a regulation of things in the earth, didn't he? Because he made decrees. See, there are certain things that can never overtake you, only because God has decreed them. Now, in Revelation, we see those decrees taken back. What are they taken back? When, when this beast is given a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies, right? When he is able to trample Jerusalem underfoot, we know at that time, that what the Lord did was remove the existing protection he had over those places. Listen, Satan can get at all of us if God removes the hedge from around us, right? That hedge, it, it will be removed. It will be. But during that time, we are to be found within Christ. Christ is the hedge that will never be removed. But listen to me carefully. In this case... Being in Christ is by your decision. It's not something God does to everybody. You have to decide and agree and obey to be within Christ. Now, when he removes the hedge off the world, only those with Christ will have that protection. The rest of the world will not, which is why those who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads suffer. Right? All these things start to happen to people who are not kept by the living God. So right now, God has a hedge on just about everything. We are in that time of grace and mercy. Right? Satan cannot freely get to anybody. But when it's removed, he will be able to get to just about anybody. So the only protection anybody's going to have in that time are those who chose to stand within Christ. And the only way to be within Christ is to obey him. So those who freely choose to obey the Lord and to maintain that obedience, those are the ones that will not be touched. Everybody else is going to be touched. That time is coming quick. The more you see evil rise in the earth, the closer to the final storm this is. Now, the final storm is simply the end of the age of grace and mercy. That's what that is. That's when the world will begin to suffer. That's when all those who are uncovered are going to start dying. They'll suffer. They'll die. For some reason, somebody has put it in people's heads that somehow we're always going to be in this age of grace and mercy, right? That God's always going to show up on the scene and protect everybody, no matter what, wrong. That's not what he's going to do. He's going to pull that from the earth. That's not going to exist. And only those who obey Christ will be found in him. Only those who keep his commandments to love their neighbor as themselves, to love the Lord thy God with all of what they are, they're going to be found with him, within him. Everybody else is going to be outside of him. And when evil is unrestrained, it's going to get to anybody and everybody who is not covered, who is not sealed. Christ is your seal. And you're only in Christ if you obey him. If you don't obey the Lord, the only reason why things don't happen to you now is because of grace and mercy all over the earth. When grace and mercy is pulled from the earth, only those who are within Christ, they won't be touched. Everybody else is going to be touched.
somebody said, what are my personal thoughts on Kim Clement? Never looked into Kim Clement. Never did. You'd be surprised how many people I don't know about. Let me give you my explanation as to why. So you understand. The reason I don't go into other people's writings, I have to be authentic with what the Lord gives me. If I go into other people's writings, it's going gonna, it's gonna to mix with what the Lord has given me. Right? We have, we have, all of us have personalities of absorption to a certain degree, which means if we start listening to everybody else's stuff, it becomes part of our own speech. I see that every single day. I'll say certain phrases on purpose, and then I'll see them on the Internet a couple of weeks later, right? That, that's absor- as an absorption personality. There are concepts and things that I'll speak about. And only after I speak about them do you see them, you know, see other people adopting them. They, they're quickly adopted. Now, it's important to me not, I can't do that with everybody else. I have to receive what I receive authentically, right? Because if I don't get it authentically, then it's just it's fraudulent. It's regurgitating what somebody else said, which is why I'm so off the wall. But then somehow over time it makes sense, right? It never makes sense when I first say it. Only later on it makes sense, right? I can't dovetail off somebody else's um, statements or theories or something like that. I, I respect and appreciate everybody else's knowledge, but I have to make sure I'm authentic to what the Lord gives me. I can't have that diluted with uh, everybody else's context, right? So if I sound like an absolute, total, 100% idiot one day, then it's because of that. Right? It's because of that. I have to be authentic with what the Lord gives me. So isolation, when you, when you take that path in life, isolation and prayer is a big part of your life. Because the Lord will give you, he'll overwhelm you with things. He really will. And I'm, there's, it's very difficult to explain certain things that the Lord gives you. It is a burden to carry it in the first place. It's very difficult to explain. And if I read somebody else's stuff, well, I would dilute what I would give to you. Right? So, I have to make sure I'm authentic anyway. So, I'm not familiar with that. Somebody said the tribe of Dan is not Revelation. It's part of the, of the 12. You know what? Guys, I'll tell you something. There are mysteries that will be known when the Lord comes back. I would encourage you to do something, though, because somebody asked me one time, they said, Micah, you should, you should find the tribe of Dan. I said, well, how's that going to benefit my relationship with Christ? Is that going to help my relationship with Christ? Anything that will help my relationship with Christ, the Lord will make sure I get it. He will. Listen to me. There are also times where wisdom is given, right? Wisdom will be given, true wisdom. Now, <clears throat> sometimes when we go hunting for things on our own, God didn't necessarily give us that knowledge. And do you know how many times people have thought they had the truth, they had the puzzle fixed, only to have it changed a few years later? I've been tracking, for example, from the time it was installed, the rapture, to this very day, everybody has been wrong so far. Why? Because they have been trying to solve when the rapture is going to happen. I don't need to solve when the rapture is going to happen. The Lord knows, and that's good enough for me. Knowing when the rapture is going to happen, knowing when the Lord is going to take everybody with him, right, who is alive at that time, right, that, that doesn't get me excited. You know what gets me excited? that the Lord gave me the ability to finish this race, to finish the task before me. So when a problem comes in my life, right, I'm always on pins and needles because I want to see the Lord in operation and work. I already know he's real. I, need, I don't have to have that proven to me. What I want to do is to be able to walk behind Christ and not stumble all over the place. That's what I want, right? I want to compliment Christ in what he's doing, not fight against him. Not disbelieve him, but compliment him. But as far as the Lord coming back to get everybody, he knows when he's going to do it. I don't need to know. I trust him. So I never try to figure that date out. Never. I'm not trying to. I have no interest in figuring that out. When the Lord's ready, he'll come again. And some people are, will not partake in the rapture because they're gone already. 
right? The rapture, by the way, is that time that was spoken of in the Bible when the Lord said that, that, that we'd forever be with the Lord. You know, we're going to be called up from this earth, changed in form. We'll forever be with him. Those who are alive at that time, at the last, at the last Trump, not the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth Trump, but at the last Trump. So, but how many have passed already? And that Trump never blew. I take this day the Lord gave me. I maximize it. I maximize it. See, most people don't want to fail the Lord over the course of time. I'm trying to be pleasing to the Lord today. He controls the paradigm of what day I enter into. I exist by his grace and mercy. I do not exist by my own accord. Right? The Lord, I don't know. I'm not promised tomorrow. This could be my last day on earth. I don't know that. And so I've got to maximize today. In order to do that, I've got to be true about this day. Not disregard this day nor the things that are in it. But truly look at everything in this day. Right? And do everything I can in compliance with the word of God. For the kingdom of God. That thing I actually believe in, which is the salvation of other people. Because there's always a better way I can do things. Don't you think? Always. <laughs> Somebody said we should be, oh. Question, preacher Micah, we should be as pure as possible when Jesus returns. Being pure is to be what? Being pure is to be what? Here we go. In order for a person to be pure, it has to be by a standard. Who has a standard of pureness that we are to become? Christ does, right? So only Christ can dictate what's impure within us. What does that mean? That means we have to endure the process. He has a sin, right? So to be pure is to endure the process God has us in, not complain every step of the way, right? But to accept that we are being cleaned, to accept that we are being washed, to accept that we are being purged of all impurities, because it's by his standard. I do not know the complete standard of the purity of the living God. I don't know. I can't know that. But the Lord does. And so if he's cleaning us, if he's washing us, if he is raising us, man, it's his process that must continue, which means his process is in my life every single day. I am not going to complain about his process. I will seek to understand it. I will rejoice in it, knowing what he's doing, but I will not complain. I will not speak against it. I will not doubt the process. I will fully embrace it by maximizing this very day. Right? We don't control what pure is. The Father does. We don't have the mind to know his purity nor his cleanness. Only he does. So when we take this day that we're given and we maximize it in the knowledge that we have in this day and we do so with an upright heart, Within Christ, with all obedience, not fighting or doubting Christ, but in compliance with his word and hoping for his outcome, not ours. We do well. Wouldn't you say? We do well. I certainly do hope for his outcome in things, not mine. I don't want my outcome. I've seen my outcome. Nobody wants my outcome. You don't want my outcome. I want the Lord's outcome. And the Lord already named, he already wrote that we can be partakers of what he's already doing. He established the gospel. We can be partakers of his gospel. That is a privilege. That is something to be joyful about. That is. See, when people stop looking into themselves and start looking into Christ, the joy comes back because you find out you're part of something already established. You don't have to go through all the groundwork. Here's the problem with human beings, though. Human beings want to be recognized as being the people who did something. Okay? This person wants to be known, well, I did that first. Well, I did this first. Well, I saw that first, and I, I came up with this first. That's what they want. And well, they fight over that. Somebody who wants the Lord's outcome to be complete in the earth, they smile every step of the way. Why? Because they can see the Lord at work. Whenever, whenever. You have a love for what the Lord is already doing. That's when you start to see what the Lord is doing. If you're blinded to that, 
That's when you feel stagnant. That's when you feel like you're doing nothing. It's because you're trying to establish yourself. So my advice is don't try to establish yourself. Look at what the Lord has already started and ask yourself a serious question. Will you complement his work or not? Or do you want your own? Because when you want your own work, isn't that competition with the Messiah? Hmm? Come on now, I'm speaking some things nobody wants to speak. But we have had it in our hearts to compete with the Messiah. Come on now. Yes, we have. We want to be noticed for this, that, and the other. That's in competition with what the Lord has already established. We know that. So when all that surrendered, when all of it surrendered, you begin to see what Messiah is doing, and nobody can tamper with your joy. Nobody. That means you won't be downcast in countenance. Because you're going to see what the Lord is doing on a daily basis. It's only when we want to be noticed for what we have done that our bad times also come with it. Hmm? Isn't that something? So, here we are again living in this day that the Lord has provided for us. Maximizing in this day. Right? That true path. Somebody says, don't let the, well, you know what? I found out something. Somebody says, don't let the enemy steal your joy, right? That's a common saying. I found out something. The enemy doesn't steal our joy. We give it to him. We do. We give it to him. How do we give it to him? Because we are trying to be joyful in areas outside of the gospel. Think about that. Whenever you try to be joyful, in areas outside the gospel, aren't we going outside the family in an attempt to find some joyful thing? We give Satan. We give Satan the joy that we have by adopting his stuff. Somebody said, Livingstone 46, X, go, Mike, is it my responsibility to purge myself or is it God's? It's yours. You purge yourself. God won't purge you. You have to purge yourself. If you agree to be purged, he'll finish the process he began in you. You have to begin the process. If I want to be purged of something, that is my responsibility. I am never to sit in a chair and say, Lord, take away this from my life. No. Nope. I am to turn away from sin. Not tell the Lord to take the sin out of me. I am to turn away from it. That's called repentance. I do that. And if I repent, it is by the Lord's power I can be kept. I cannot keep myself. I can initiate. The Lord will finish. Do you hear me? You initiate it. The Lord will finish. You initiate. He'll finish. He'll finish the work he began in you. He begins the work of purging. Right? But we have to make that decision. We do. Let's go ahead and face it. We, we sometimes can be lazy. Let's go ahead and face it. Lord, take this away the easiest way possible, where I have no withdrawals, no anything, no pain, no discomfort, no anything. Okay, got the list. Okay, start. That's what we want. It didn't work that way. When you repent, that's by your own accord. You initiate who put the thought in you? Your father did by truth. Only truth can cause a person to repent. Only truth. So you receive that truth. Act on it. Turn away from the sin, but it is God that will finalize and give you the strength to do it. Only by his miracle, his miraculous power, can you be freed from what you desire to purge yourself from. See, when you want to be a clean vessel, you don't want junk inside of you. You don't want junk on you. You don't want any of those things. Somebody would say, well, smoking isn't a sin. No, no, I don't think it is a sin. You know what's a sin? Huh? Well, how could smoking ever be connected to a sin? I'll tell you why. Because if you're out there smoking in front of non-believers, you just authorize and them to pollute their bodies. You did, because you represent the kingdom of God. 
If you're a Christian, you represent the kingdom. You're also an ambassador, which means you can authorize or not authorize what people see you doing. Uh Uh-oh. So if you're out there doing something, you just authorized in their minds that activity in the kingdom. Somebody says, well, smoking cigarettes is no different than smoking marijuana. Right? Okay. Well, if you believe that, then smoking poison ivy is no different than smoking cigarettes or marijuana. I don't see anybody out there smoking poison ivy. Where are those smokers at? Who smokes poison ivy? Huh? Because it's not good. Let's go ahead and face it. We compensate for those things we have a desire to do. My goodness. People know why they smoke marijuana. It's not because it smells so good. They know why they do it. But here's the problem. Without the marijuana, who are you? Hmm? Who are you without the cigarettes? You're a wreck. You find you have no healing. You've not been repaired. So then the marijuana and the cigarettes mask a condition. Do you hear me? And so let me tell you this, one day you will not be able to get a hold of it. Neither one. Not one piece of it. Who will you be then? See, people want the Lord to work in their lives. But we have to get serious. Never ask the Father for half a healing. We know those things are compensators. We know what they are. Isn't it funny how we never ask for healing? In those areas where we like to do something, we find our own, our own crutch. And we heal ourselves. Well, I got news for you. All that will be uncovered. In the day it's uncovered, it is not going to be a pretty day. And it's coming. You know that with these disasters, pharmaceutical companies are going to be taken down to the ground. Stuff will not circulate. Crops will be destroyed. And people will become what they really are. If you mask it now, you're just fooling yourselves into believing that somehow you've been freed from it. No. Mm-mm. You're not. The Lord stands ready to heal for real. You hear me? For real. Not some fake healing. A real healing. Now, what if a person who smokes marijuana because they can't deal with social anxieties were actually healed by the Messiah to the point where they had no social anxieties? The Lord healed them deeply all the way through. Now, that person would have a testimony. That's a real healing. That's a thorough healing. That's a heavenly healing. And that's what the Lord stands ready to do. Not some half healing. Why would the Lord ever come to half heal somebody? That'd be like a doctor. You know, you come in for a broken leg. He said, I'll tell you what. Now, I can't fix your whole broken leg. But I can, you know, I can straighten your ankle out. But, But what? You wouldn't go to a doctor like that, would you? You break three ribs. And he says, well, you know, I can't fix your ribs. But I can make your skin look like you never broke your ribs. But nobody wants that. Nobody wants you. You want the real thing. Right? You want the real thing. People do things for weird reasons. My point is, for every habit, for everything man has invented that we gravitated towards, we can be freed from everything on this earth, not some things. Everything. And do you not know for those things that you haven't surpassed, healing will come with the Lord when he comes, if you're alive during that time. So what I'm telling you, though, is authentically approach it. That's all. See, it's not even about, it's not what you think. Why in the Bible does it, it says, you know, that that, um, wine makes your heart marry, right? And a merry heart can actually start healing in your body is what it equates to. But Jesus said, don't drink strong drink. He said nothing about wine. 
So in truth, it's okay to drink wine, but it's not okay to drink strong drink. Why? Why? In fact, the Bible says don't drink to the point of drunkenness. Why? It's a known fact that wine is good for your body. But the Lord says don't drink to the point of drunkenness. Why? Because when you drink to the point of drunkenness, you have no self-control. You have no spiritual control. You have no filter or anything else. And the first thought that comes to your head, you begin speaking. And you damage people. And you cause damage that way. You have no restraint. Right? You cannot subdue your flesh. You let your flesh take the reins of your life, and it guides you everywhere. We're not to live by flesh, nor walk by the flesh. We're to walk by the Spirit, right? You cannot walk by the Spirit if you're doing all things of flesh. Correct? So you're not in your right mindset, which means any spirit out there can use you to any degree when you're drunk, when you're not sober. And that's the key. Being sober means you have control over all your faculties, right? When you're drunk, you do not. You throw caution to the wind. People end up doing things they regret. They harm other people a lot. God does not want you drunken with anything. That is to say to be saturated with anything. He doesn't want you saturated with anything. He wants you to be sober. So that means drinking is not the problem. The alteration of the mind from the drinking is the problem, isn't it? Yes, it is. Do you know how that is? Smoking is the same thing. Believe it or not, smoking a cigarette is a compensator for social anxieties. Marijuana is a compensator for social anxieties, especially people who smoke marijuana. They compensate for social anxieties. They can't go around everybody without having one of those. They'll have a nervous breakdown. It becomes a crutch. But what happens if somebody can take it away? Hmm? Then you become somebody different, somebody who cannot tolerate other people. In some cases, people become monsters. They chew people's heads off. They say things they would never, ever say at any time because they've never dealt with things. They were never healed from things. And so without those Band-Aids, which is what cigarettes, marijuana, and drinking is. Without that Band-Aid, the wound is uncovered. And then we discover it was never healed. The day is coming when not one person will have a Band-Aid. All will be uncovered. All will be brought to light. You know, in the Bible it says, it's not what goes in a man that defiles him, but what comes out. Do you see? Do you see that now? It's not the stuff going in you that defiles you. It's what comes out, and what comes out after you're being altered is nothing but the high states of iniquity. Of much harm to other folks. All sorts of things. All right. My well, mouse just jumped off the desk. Rumi says, you're not in your right mind. That's right. You're not in your right mind. You're not. In fact, people who smoke cigarettes live with a high. <laughs> Someone says, do you know why Brazil is so hot? I'm not going to Brazil. I'm not doing that. Brazil is always hot. But folks, get ready in America for heat. Get ready in Europe for heat. Get ready in Russia for heat. Yes, I said it. Russia, get ready for heat. Get ready for a, a positional change of the equator itself. Get ready, get ready. Get ready, the fires are coming. They're coming, the fires are coming. We live in the very days most people used to uh, discuss prior to 2012. We live in those days now. And now it's really coming, and people don't have the enthusiasm they used to. You believe that? The things are really forming. They're really coming. Do I think the eclipse will trigger the pole shift? No, I do not. I think that eclipse is a signal, just as the Lord set them for. I do believe that. Now, when the Lord gives a signal, right, a signal is a warning prior to an appointed time. Okay? For signs and for signals. 
that is a indication of an appointed time. So you know what that means. This eclipse, I believe, will happen without incident. It's my belief. I believe immediately after that eclipse, based on man's decision that very day. You better listen to me. There's going to be a big decision that day. That day, and that's going to be a, the, uh, the day of the eclipse is the beginning of that decision. The day after the eclipse, they will start finishing that decision. If they decide the wrong way, here it comes. Here it comes. Just keep living. You'll see. I'm the only source for that. So please don't ask for a source. I'm the only source for that one. Nobody right now would agree with me, probably. Probably. Mike, when will you tell us what happens at the end of the 40 days? If you remember at the beginning of the 40 days, what did I say? I said, this is, um, this is we have to get some things done before the 40 days is up, so help me keep count. I also said I wouldn't go into details, remember that? You'll know when it's time. You'll know when it's time. And it's meant to be just that way, right? You'll know when it's time. We just have some things to accomplish which will determine quite a bit. It'll determine quite a bit for us. It will determine quite a bit for us. So let it unfold. It'll determine quite a bit. I do that by way of instruction. I do. Did I have an idea as to what would end up on that 40th day? No. That was spiritual. I'm quirky that way. I do things that way. Can I see what could potentially happen? Yes. But I'm not to tell it. I'm not to go tell that on the mountain. It will determine some things, both for COT, for us, and a few other things. But uh, we still have time. We still have time. Somebody says, my compass is moving for three months now. North is no longer where it is. Yes, magnetic north is what your compass is pointing towards. And it will often shift like that. Don't be alarmed by that too much unless it slides out 90 degrees. If it goes 90 degrees, we, gotta, we have an issue, right, a problem. I will tell you this. The northern lights are not going to be just northern lights anymore. And you, all of you who are familiar with COT, you know what that means. Here it comes. Here it comes. So I said, would you answer, repeat that question from with orange negative blood? We get this a lot with orange negative blood. Listen, guys. Uh, when it comes to blood types and things, I can tell you right now I'm not going to agree with any public narrative. That means that is to say any narrative that you may be familiar with. I am familiar with uh, a certain aspect of it, and that's what I have to go with. I can't go by what anybody else said. I have no experience with that. I only have experience in certain specific things, those things I can talk about. If I don't have experience with it, I can't talk about it. I, I just can't do that right? because it's not my knowledge. My knowledge are those things that the Lord has put me right in the middle of. That's my knowledge. Those are the subjects I can be passionate behind. I can't be passionate behind somebody else's information. I can't do that. So I may not be the best source uh, to speak of that, right? Am I familiar with orange negative? Yes, I am. Am I familiar with the orange negative? And, and uh, they call it orange negative individual chains? Yes, I am. Or most people know. What is the most unique blood type on the earth? O positive. It is the opposite of what most people think. Listen, I found out in this world my own life, and this is why I don't discuss a great many things, is that most of what the public gravitates towards 
Matt has been hiding my theory. It's just that a theory. It, it, it is not the real deal. The real deal is often so opposite of what these theories are, right? That you would not want to hear the truth. And sometimes the truth is so minimal that it's not worth stating. It's not going to cause the impact you think. It's not going to be the big mystery you thought it was. And some of the most silliest things on this earth are the largest keys and answers to mysteries. But you can never capture it anyway, right? Like this UFO thing. The UFO subject hides another subject that's just like it, but it misdirects it to get people to think of it in a certain light. Hmm? Someone said, Michael, can you tell us more about the nines? No, not yet. No. Only that nines are upside down sixes. Right? Seven and eight are responsible for eating nine. I think seven is responsible for eating nine. I can tell you that one too. Seven, eight, nine. That's it. That's all I got right now. That's all I got. More the, about the fish in, in, uh, in the seas. Well, I will tell you this. The problem with the fish in the oceans is not an isolated issue. I can tell you that. I'm going to be careful with that subject. That That's a spooky subject. It is. It's a spooky. It's spooky because those who have experienced it, uh, they know exactly how spooky that can be, right? So what if that were to happen to mankind? It will. But what if it were to happen to mankind? And it will. That would be awful. You have stingrays swimming on their backs on the top of, top of the water. You have fish that are swimming in, 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 uh, vertically in circles, right? Uh, it's just not good. And what if mankind were to start doing the same things? And they will. Did you hear me? They will. They're going to start doing the same things on land. It's a very spooky subject. And we don't have the right foundation for that right now. But it is spreading. But what happens to sea life? That's going to happen to humanity too. That's going to be bad. Anyway, that's something that was, uh, that's one of those things, folks. That's another plague, you could say. Another plague. Another plague, indeed. Somebody says, why is our language, ESP, the English language, so messed up? Why is our language, especially the English, well, English was formulated from what's called a witch's tongue and old incantations that when a person speaks, they're in compliance with what rules uh, those who speak English. English is not some God-given language. It's not what it is. Eng English was put together by some very authoritative people who had high-level knowledge in dark areas. And we speak it every single day. I'm telling you now that without Christ, we are condemned. But with Christ, we have the promise of full redemption. That truth, too, will come out. That'll come out. So no one who speaks English speaks with a, an innocent tongue. And it is partly the reason, without the covering of Christ, we deal with so many emotional states. It is. Of all the different people in the earth, Americans deal with all the emotional states. We do. Because we're constantly in agreement with incantations, rituals, and rites. That is sewn into our language. We have an incredibly impure language. And it is brand new. It's not old. It's brand new. 
Well, partly brand new, partly ancient. That's a good midnight hour topic. It is. But not tonight. Not this midnight, but, but to come. Right? Is ringing in the ears from technology or comments orbiting near? Well, ringing in the ears began in 1982. It was a big deal in 1982. Right? So we don't know what happened in 1982. That was that was the height of radio transmissions. Is what it was. Cable television, right? So then, uh, radio transmissions were at their height. And when people used to get their or get away from uh, uh, power lines and everything like that, they'd have that tonal ringing. But don't mistake the tonal ringing from the patterned ringing, because some people will hear a pattern that goes do 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 do, and then it's gone, right? And sometimes it'll turn on, it'll hit two very high tones, followed by a mid-tone, and then turn off. And some people have the, the analog tones that hit, right, because they're in specific areas. If anything captures my attention, it's going to be those uh, interval tones. The ones that go deep, deep, deep. Or they have some sort of a sequence. That's not tinnitus. You know, if something is happening like that, it's not tinnitus. Now, your brain does something called entrainment. You should read about that. What your brain will do is follow all frequencies, all of them, right? Because you have to know about the mechanism of entrainment. You also have to know the mechanism of the ear and how it nullifies frequencies. Your ear can replicate every frequency it hears, every noise it hears. Your ear has a capability of replicating so it can nullify it. So in other words, it can, it can send out the opposite signal of whatever signal you receive. For example, if you have a fan running in a house, nothing else running but the fan, your ear will then produce the sound of that fan to nullify it, right, from the interpreter in your brain. So then you don't even think about the fan. You stop hearing it. So if somebody walks in your front door and they talk, right, you can hear the person talking over the fan because your ear has filtered out the fan. But when you turn everything off, especially if you had that fan running for a long time, when you turn everything off, your ear continues to produce that anti-signal for the fan. It will continue to do this, and it takes about a day or two for it to actually go away. So you 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 can never chalk that the issues with the ears up to just one thing. That that takes some looking into. It can be deciphered as to what it's coming from, but the first step is to go into a clean environment that is noise free. We have to expose all of it. After about a day, all those noises you can make go away. When they all go away, I have to warn you, though, everything is loud, right? If somebody claps their hands repeatedly, at first it's loud, but then it begins to, you know, it gets lower and lower. If somebody continued to clap their hands, you would stop hearing it. In about 15 minutes, you would no longer hear somebody clapping their hands anymore, right? But at first, if somebody were clapping their hands at the same level and somebody else was talking, you probably would not be able to hear the talking over the hands. If the person continued to clap for 15 minutes and somebody else continued to talk, you would no longer hear the clapping. You would hear the person talking. Your brain and your ear work together to take consistent or constant noises from the environment, and it can negate them or nullify them so that you don't hear them. They're not entering into your brain. Everything else is. That's what your body does. The body is an amazing thing, and it does that all by its lonesome. That's why an alarm clock, if you have the same alarm on your alarm clock, you're going to start, you, one day you're going to say, well, the alarm didn't go off. But in truth, it did. You just stopped hearing it, right? And when you change the tone of the alarm, all of a sudden your alarm clock works again. It's not that the alarm clock broke. It's not that they, you didn't hear it. You did hear it, but your your ear and your brain filtered that sound out because it was happening too much. That happens all the time. All the time. That's why the new, any new alarm, it changes its tone by itself over the course of a couple of days or so, so you'll always wake up.
And can you give any advice or help on OCD or PTSD? PTSD, I can. OCD is a choice. OCD is just a choice. If you're a controlling person, if you want everything controlled and put your way, you're going to have OCD. Give up control and OCD disappears. Hmm? OCD is when a person tries to please themselves. They feel comfortable when they can control every aspect of everything. That's OCD. You start letting go of everything. You'll stop having OCD. Right? Concerning PTSD, that comes by way of guilt. They swore up and down for many years. You probably have, you're supposed to, you know, all these guys have PTSD. You're supposed to have PTSD. I don't have PTSD. Why would I have post-traumatic stress disorder? What happened, happened. I can't change that. Can't do anything about it. It's the way it is. You have to continue to go forward. It's not being cold-hearted either. I cannot go back in time and change anything. Right? Even though some people think that time travel exists and it doesn't. I can't go back in time and change anything. Oh, there was a midnight hour I want to have. You just said it. I'm going to write it down. It is not like last time. The last midnight hour was different. We were talking about bondage and, and identifying issues and giving the explanations for those issues so that we can operate by directives, right, to break free of the bondage. But this midnight hour is going to be about one of the biggest deceitful things you've never heard of. But that it's going to spread. I'm going to tell you about a certain look on things that will spread and Satan will add to the lie and everybody will believe it. Everybody is going to believe it and act on it. And so one of these been that hours I'm going to have to tell you about. Excuse me about that. I just wrote that down too. Because I couldn't think of it last time. I was I was going to tell you guys last time, but the Lord said no, so I didn't do it. But I'll certainly do it this time, if the Lord says yes. The Lord says yes. PTSD. When you do things in life, you don't have to go to combat and have PTSD. You don't. There could be a situation that happened in your life that just turned your life upside down. Right? That's the beginnings of PTSD. It is when a person has not resolved the past. And because they have not resolved the past, they often see it in certain things. These traumatic moments, because they carry the blame of things in the past to the degree that they recreate it visually and by way of their environment through many different things and their triggers in their environment. The moment they forgive or they realize they've been forgiven from that past, there's no more PTSD. Once you sever the connection, and blame is a big part of it, PTSD is gone. It's gone. Just in case you didn't know, I've worked with a lot of people with PTSD. And the outcome seems to be always the same. It takes a little while to get a person to reconnect with the guilt part of it. That's, part, that's the hardest part. But then once they see it again, it's severed in a very special way. And they're free every single time. So far, every single time. It's a blessing. Hmm. It's a blessing. But, yeah, there it is. I don't have PTSD. And if a person wants free on PTSD, well, then they have to, they have to go back and reconcile some things in truth. They have to lose control and reconcile in truth. They do. People are terrified of losing power. They are. And that's part of the issue, too. A person can be totally healed from PTSD, totally healed. They're never fixed. They're healed from PTSD. PTSD is a mindset which triggers everything else in the body. And it is very real. Right? It is very real. Someone said, have children, you'll let go of OCD. You sure will when you find out you're not going to keep everything in order. You'll either drive yourself nuts or lock your kids in bird cages. 
Or let go of the OCD. That is true. I wouldn't recommend the birdcage thing. Don't do that. Autism. You guys know my point of view on autism. I think autistic children and people are incredibly special. And for some reason, I communicate very well with them. I do. Very well. Anyway, folks, I'm going to be back. It's break time. I'll be back in a few minutes just for a little bit. I'm going to cut tonight short because I am, uh, well, that's late. What is wrong with me? You know, that happens. That happens. I can't believe it's uh, the time it is now. Anyway, I'm going to take a short break. I'll be right back in a few minutes. How many of you guys live in a city? How many of you guys live in a city? How many? If you live in a city, doesn't matter which one, you can be in anywhere. If you live in a city, please be ready for the heat and the power outages this year. Can you do that? Be ready for power outages and heat. Have your exit plan ready. Know where the stairs are because you're not going to have an elevator in a power outage. And if it's hot, you probably need to get out of the building. Right? So make sure you know where things are. Also, make sure you know where things are when the floods come. Can you do that? Make sure you have that plan together. Many will not be prepared for the water. They're not going to be prepared for the heat. Some will have to get up and leave and never come back. Please be prepared. Please be prepared. That means in, in your city, your town, you have to know exit points if you drive a car. You're going to have to know that if, if something happens where people have to evacuate, you're going to hit the highways. Known exits of that city. Have your plan together before any of that happens. Think it through. Have alternatives. Okay? Always have that ready. That's a personal, that's, a, that's like uh, if you go inside of a grocery store, right? You're supposed to know where the exits are. You don't want to go in a grocery store and something happening. You're trapped in there when the exit was right behind you. You have to be vigilant in these days. It, it's sad to say, sad to say, but I've contacted some more counties who are unclear of an exit strategy for their towns. They're not clear. They don't have an uh, exit strategy for fires, for floods, for other happenings. They're not clear on that. When you call these guys up and they have no clear plan that they can guide you to, then they're not clear. They didn't think it through. And so they need to, be, they need to have that stuff in place this year. Not next year, this year. This summer. So make sure that you know. For the sake of your families. For the sake of your peace. That you have thought things through. Who would move into a house and never inspect the house? I wouldn't know. Would you guys do that? Who would do that? Who would eat a piece of food and never look at it? Who would do that? Would you do that? Don't you look at your food before you take a bite? Yes, you do. You look at it. You inspect it. Because if something is wrong, if something is crawling in there, if a leg comes out, right, you're not going to eat that. Correct? So if we inspect those small things, with the extra step, Make sure you have an exit strategy. Make sure you think that through. You guys who live in places where there are, there are certain areas of the USA that will be hit by lots of tornadoes. Do you have your plan in place? Right? Do you, have you looked at that or did you ignore it? Now, many people, most people wait for the big event. Don't do that. Don't do that. 
Do it for the place that you live in, right? Have alternatives. Don't just set one route. Set a few routes. Have an understanding that if somebody evacuates, calls an evacuation of a city, the roads are going to get clogged quickly, right? So that means uh, you're going to have to have some sort of alternative. You're going to have to know that terrain. Anybody who moves in a new place, it is important to them that they get some sort of map. Right, GPS is fine, but you need a map. A map. Somebody can print out a map. Right? We can handle that at uh, uh, COT for everybody. We can have some sort of submission and then look up maps in accordance with where you guys are. That'll surely help other people out. But look at those things. All right? Because we're going to be facing some very different uh, issues this year. Also, quarantine. You guys are already familiar with quarantine procedures. Make sure you have your things in order. Matter for quarantine is called for your specific area. You are not caught unaware. Do that too, okay? Do that too. Please do those things. And we'll talk more in these areas because I'm, I, I would say that would be helpful to everybody, right? In a real constructive way with some work behind it. I think that would help some people out a lot. Hmm? Somebody said, Mike, I, I do my best, but I can't deal with all that. No, you never deal with all that, right? Listen, there's a difference between living in an illusion and living. Now, God never told us to shut our eyes to the environment he put us in. No. He said we are to be as wise as serpents, as harmless as doves. Listen to me. The world has taught people, oh, don't look at all that and get stressed out. Those are other people's words. Those are not your words, right? Think about it. Those are not your words. You just repeated what you heard from somebody else. Those are not your words. Your father never gave you that mentality. He never gave you those words, never. That's what the world gave you. That's what somebody in the world gave you. We've got to stop listening to those people in the world. Listen to our father. Be as wise as the serpent. Why is the serpent wise? Because it knows everything in its surroundings. Serpents, by the way, are everywhere. Do you know why you don't see serpents most of the time? Because they avoid you. They know exactly where you are, but they avoid you. Know your surroundings. Try not to adopt the sayings of other people. Don't emulate the people of the world, but the people of your Lord. Hmm? You can make yourself afraid of things you shouldn't be afraid of. You can adopt the sayings and mentalities of the world and be afraid of everything. Your father did not give you the mindset to be afraid of a thing. The world did that. Time to undo that. Don't adopt the sayings of the world. You'll cripple yourself, right? Don't do that. Know your surroundings. Face everything. Listen, ladies, face everything. Don't look away from things. That's an adoption of the mindset of the world. Your father never gave you that. That is fear talking. Not you. Not you. And if you're not careful, ladies, specifically, fear can replicate itself from you to other people. you right. No, no. Face everything. If you're scared to look at something, that's when you look at it. I don't like spiders, right? I can't stand spiders. I was terrified of spiders when I was young. And I don't like them. I really don't like them. So I wouldn't learn everything about them. I wouldn't saw every spider I could possibly see. I don't like spiders, right? But if one came around... I know what it can and cannot do. Do you know that takes fear away? I don't like the way they look. I don't. But I know what they can or cannot do. And one day, a spider dropped right on my chest. A big one. A bird eater. Right?
big one, beautiful, big, beautiful, ugly thing. I almost had 17 connection fits. But because I had looked into all these different spiders I knew what it could and couldn't do, I didn't want the hairs flicked in my face. And so I handled that situation accordingly. Did I like it? No, I didn't. But wisdom took over, and fear could not operate. Face everything. Right? I'm not frightened of scorpions. And when you know it, I got bit by one. I got stung by one. And then I'm not frightened of, uh, I got bit by a um, black widow. I did. But I knew about its venom. And so the pain only lasted for about an hour, and that was it. And it never came back. When you know things, when you face your fears, right? That's what your father, that's the spirit your father put in you. He did not put a wimp spirit in any of his children. He put a David spirit in all of his children. The problem is, if we continue to listen to the world, we're going to be wimpy in all these areas. The Lord didn't make us that way. We adopted those things from other people who are afraid, who operate by the spirit of fear. These are learned behaviors we must unlearn. So face all things. And when it comes to your city or town, know it. Know it. Think about that tornado. Right? Sure, it hasn't come, but think about it and say, hmm, what would I do? Have an understanding that the Lord, right? He will instruct you and guide you, but he's also given you the ability to see and to hear and to go find and to research, hasn't he? And let me tell you something about the Lord, whether you believe this or not. The Lord requires us to do everything we're able to do. He will not do what we're able to do. He's not going to do it. When your life breaks down, in truth, isn't it because you did not do something that you were able to do? For the most part, when people's lives break down in truth, isn't it because we got lazy in a certain area? To us tell the truth. Isn't it because we said, well, you know, I'll look at that tomorrow, and tomorrow's when it blew up, right? Isn't it because we overlooked areas that we could have looked into, and because we set that thing to the side? It blew up, right? If we look at the truth of our lives... We can't really point externally to everybody else. We'll get these feelings, right, like something is not right. And we will fail to look over what we have an ability to look over. Then the inevitable takes place. And when you find out what took place, you say, why didn't I look over this the other day? Why didn't I act on it when I had this feeling? Why didn't I just handle it then? Is that the truth? And we have to, you know, not, I've done that, listen, I've done that enough to know that Michael has caused at least 90% of the problems Michael has ever had in his life. I can't blame that on Satan or anybody else. I did it. I did it. But I had to undo that mindset. That mindset did come from the world. Nowhere in the Word of God does it ever teach us to put something off today, right, that we are able to do today and then just do it tomorrow. That's not what it teaches. As things come, handle them. Handle them, right? Yes, they come in inopportune times. Do you know what, ha what would happen if you had everything the way you want it? You think you'd live the life of peace and happiness and everything. That's wrong. That is absolutely incorrect. If you had everything the way you wanted them to be, you would become lifeless, spiritless. And some people know exactly what I'm talking about. Because even your spirit does not rise until it's challenged. The only time your spirit rises is when somebody comes out with something absolutely false and challenges you or something about you, something dealing with your salvation in the Word of God. And because of that, you become alive again, right? You're dead when everything is going right, and you know that's the truth. You're dead. You reach a point where nothing satisfies, where everything is mundane, and you start feeling lifeless. You already know that, and your father knows it too. Why do you think you have these shake-ups in your life? 
They keep you alive. They keep you going. Yes, they're bad sometimes. But they add life to your life. Because have you noticed that God will shake you up right at the very time you were going downhill? When you were giving in to your conditions. When you were giving in to your circumstances. Then he shook everything up, didn't he? Now you're alive again with a newfound sense of forward motion. Huh? Some of you have that wisdom you understand, but you also understand you had to go through something to get there. That you were dying, and you would not admit it. We already know this. Young people out there, right? That's what happens when you get what you want. You will die inside. The Lord knows exactly what he's doing. He does. It does not look like it's to our benefit most of the time. But he knows exactly what he's doing. He knows what it takes to deliver us all the way. And that's precisely what he's doing. He's not punishing you, right? Nobody's doing anything vindictive towards you. He's doing what he must do to keep you. Hmm? To keep you. Folks, I'm going to let you guys go. I'm going to see you next time right here at COT tomorrow. I'll be talking to Pastor Paul tomorrow so i may have a talk with you guys prior to that time i may do that or we may have a midnight hour right after that uh, thursday talk that may happen too either way god bless and keep all of you i'm gonna see you guys next time right here at cot and you guys remember something the lord will deliver you all the way all the way remember that take care of one another i'll see you next time